Okay, so um, our last speaker, we're happy to have Andrew Lowe. He's at Harris and Harris Group, Professor of Finance at MIT in the Sloan School of Management. He's going to talk about the origins of behavior, intelligence, and bounded rationale. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by uh, thanking Brown University and the Summers Conference for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, and thank all of you for staying for the very last session. I realize I'm the only one between you and dinner, so <laughs> I'm going to try to uh, keep it brief uh, and actually continue on the theme of the previous talk of using mathematics to try to model behavior. Uh, now, speaking of behavior, I uh, read a recent uh, psychological study that pointed out that uh, glucose is a pretty important input for uh, prefrontal cortex activity. And so if we're gonna do a little mathematics, and this is the end of the session, I came prepared. What I'm gonna do is to uh, ask you each to uh, take a piece of chocolate so that uh, <laughs> you'll actually get to concentrate. <laughs> uh, I learned from the Republican candidate, there's nothing wrong with pandering for the audience. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I have to say at the outset, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, that I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I like to think of myself as a, uh, an intelligent consumer of mathematics. Uh, I'm an economist by training. And very early on, it was clear to me that there was a pecking order in the fields uh, that we study in high school and college. We all know that mathematics is up here, the queen of all sciences. <laughs> You've got physics, and biology, chemistry, and so on. <clears throat> And where economics fit um, was uh, made clear to me very early on when I heard a joke told by a math professor. He said that uh, he came across a bar once where there was uh, three graduate students uh, having a little too much to drink, a mathematician, uh, a physicist, uh, and an economist. And after a few too many drinks, they decided to uh, try to prove theorems that they just come up with on the spot, one of which was that uh, all odd numbers are prime. And uh, so the mathematician decided to start first, and he said, okay, well, let's see, three is prime, five, five is prime, seven is prime, therefore by induction, all odd numbers are prime. <laughs> uh, the uh, physicist's turn came, and he said, well, let's see, three is prime, seven is prime, uh, nine is not prime, that's an experimental error, 11 is prime, 13 is prime, all odd numbers are prime. And then, of course, it was the economist's turn, and the economist said, well, let's see, 3 is prime, 5 is prime, 7 is prime, 9 is prime, 11 is prime. <laughs> so, you get the sense very quickly where economists stood in that hierarchy. But over the last uh, few decades, we've seen that mathematics has had more and more of an impact on behavior. And so what I want to try to describe to you today is some recent research that my co-author Tom Rennan and I have been working on and trying to understand the origin of behavior using relatively simple mathematical models. So if you'll forgive the informality, I'm gonna do a few experiments uh, with you, live experiments, non-invasive, it won't hurt. Uh, but we're gonna see how you behave in certain settings, and then I'm gonna try to construct simple models to try to explain it. Yeah? Is that Tom Brennan from Northwestern? It is Tom Brennan from Northwestern. And in fact, this is an interesting story. Tom Brennan, some of you might know him, he's a uh, professor of law uh, of all things. What is an economist and a lawyer doing studying behavior in biology? Uh, Tom is actually a mathematician by training as well. He received a, a PhD in mathematics from Harvard, uh, as well as a law degree from Harvard. A very, very interesting individual. And uh, actually, he and I just got to know each other almost randomly because he wrote a letter uh, to the Laboratory for Financial Engineering asking whether or not we could uh, uh, offer him a postdoc at the time he was at Goldman Sachs. And uh, so somebody with that interesting a background, a PhD and a law degree, and working at Goldman Sachs, I felt I had to talk to him, and we started collaborating. And he's, he's been a terrific uh, collaborator for this project. So let me start with a little bit of background about economic theory. Most of you uh, have heard about it uh, over the course of today's uh, lectures with Glenn Ellison and, and others. Uh, but I want to recap a couple of elements of economic theory that you may not be aware of, which is that Unlike psychology and other disciplines, in economics, we have actually only one theory of behavior. And that theory was developed in the 1940s. It was developed by uh, von Neumann and Morgan Stern in their book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. So the same folks who gave us game theory, cooperative game theory, uh, as opposed to John Nash, who focused on uh, non-cooperative game theory, 
They also gave us the basic idea of how humans behave, namely by maximizing this thing called expected utility. And Paul Samuelson was the second individual who, in his thesis, his PhD thesis, which he very modestly titled Foundations of Economic Analysis. <laughs> Remember, he was a PhD student in economics. Uh, the fact is, it was modest because it did lay down the foundations of what we consider today to be modern neoclassical economics. And the theory is very simple. It says that people maximize expected utility. That is, we all have a function very deep within us called the utility <coughs> function. And the utility function is basically an index of the degree of happiness that we experience when we consume a certain set of bundle of goods. Now, these goods are random. For example, if you buy a share of Microsoft stock, you're getting a random cash flow. Then you don't maximize your utility in that case, because how do you ra maximize a random number? What you do is you maximize the expectation of that utility function of a random number. And so the theory of expected utility says that utility functions are everywhere non-decreasing. More is preferred to less. And they're concave, so you've got risk aversion. And this theory of behavior has really taken over virtually all of economics. So any graduate or undergraduate economics course you've ever taken starts with expected utility theory. And it's the only theory that we teach our graduate students even to this day. Now what's wrong with that, what's wrong with it is that it actually doesn't work. The theory is contradicted by all sorts of experiments. Experiments by psychologists and experimental economists that show that people don't maximize expected utility because they have all sorts of biases. One summer, I spent the entire summer reading the literature in economics and finance, and all of the biases that are documented here, things like probability matching, loss aversion, anchoring, framing, overconfidence, underconfidence, hurting, mental accounting, all of these biases are actually present in all of us. And by the end of the summer, I was convinced that the human animal is the stupidest creature on Earth. And I'm going to illustrate that to you in a couple of examples, and then we'll do a little bit of math to try to see if we can understand it. So here's the first example. I'm going to ask you to choose between two investment alternatives. So I'm hoping that you've eaten your chocolates by now so that your prefrontal cortex is really firing. OK, investment alternative A is a $240,000 profit for sure. If you pick A, you're going to get paid $240,000. If, on the other hand, you pick B, you get a lottery ticket that will pay you a million dollars with 25% probability and nothing with 75% probability. Which would you prefer? Now, before you answer, let me help you. This is a math conference, after all. Let me help you by computing the expected value of B. The expected value of B is $250,000, which is more than $240,000. Higher expected return. But you don't get $250,000 for sure. You get either a million or nothing. So which would you prefer? Higher risk, higher expected return. Lower risk, lower expected return. Typically in finance, we would say that there's no right or wrong answer. It's just a question of your personal risk preferences. Okay. So tell me, how many people prefer A? Raise your hand. Wow. How about B? Any B takers? OK, a smattering, maybe four or five. All right, let's keep that in the back of our minds. Get most of the people pick A over B. That's not surprising, because we have that concave utility, right? We're risk averse. And so if there's risk, we tend to shy away from it unless we get rewarded. And the reward seems hardly worth it, because you're only getting an extra 10,000 in expected value, and you're getting a lot of volatility, either a zero or a million. OK, let's take a look at another two choices. Choice C is a sure loss of $750,000. You pick C, you owe me $750,000, right? That's a lot of money. Even, even as high as tuition is here, this is a lot of money. All right, what about D? D is a lottery ticket where you will lose a million dollars with 75% probability, or you can lose nothing with 25% probability. Now in this case, in this case, the expected values are the same. But you don't get the expected value with D. You lose a million with 75% probability, or you lose nothing with 25% probability. Which would you prefer of these two choices? 
And when I give this to my MBA students, they get very upset. They say, well, we want neither, thank you. <laughs> but you can imagine a situation where you've got to make the best of two bad alternatives, right? Someone else said, this is like the uh, Republican uh, presidential <laughs> candidate. You've got to pick the best of two bad alternatives. How many people would pick C, the short loss? Wow, one person. OK, how about D, everybody else? Okay. Well, what we did just now in the last few minutes is something that was first done in Stanford University by two psychology professors, Kahneman and Tversky. They did it with Stanford undergraduates using real money, not nearly as big a set of prizes as this. Uh, I have to add extra zeros to the prizes because I teach MBA students. <laughs> and what we found today is exactly what they found in their experiment. That is, the vast majority of subjects pick A over B, and the vast majority of subjects P pick D over C. Now, why is that interesting? Well, let me tell you why. The, the most popular choice that we saw in this room today, A and D, let me show you what you would have gotten, those of you who picked those two. If you had picked the two choices A and D, you would have had $240,000 with 25% probability, because you picked a, you get 240 for sure, but when you pick D as well, there's a 25% chance that you'll lose nothing on D, which means you get to keep the set at 240, but there's a 75% chance that you'll lose a million on D, so that means you're down net 760, right? A million minus 240 is 760. So those of you who picked A and D, that's equivalent to the single lottery ticket where you get 240 with 25% probability or minus 760 with 75% probability. What about the choices that most of you did not pick? Well, if you had picked B and C, what would you have gotten? You would have gotten the same probability of winning and losing, 25 and 75. But when you win, you win 250, not 240. And when you lose, you lose 750, not 760. In other words, if you had picked B and C, when you win, you would win 10,000 more, and when you would lose, you would lose 10,000 less. In other words, if you had picked B and C, that is equivalent to A and B plus $10,000 cash. Each of you who picked A and B basically left $10,000 lying on the sidewalk. Now, which would you prefer? For those of you who would still prefer A and D, please see me afterwards, and we'll do a little trade. I will help you uh, carry this. Now, when I show this example to the MBA students, they, they get really mad, and they say, well, that's not fair, because when you told me about A and B, you didn't tell me about C and D. Now, if you show it to me like this, I would easily pick A and D. And so my response, first of all, is life isn't fair. You may as well get used to it now. And, uh, <laughs> but the better response is that this example is not nearly as contrived as you might think, because in a multinational organization, the London office can be faced with choices A and B, and the Tokyo office can be faced with choices C and D. And locally, it doesn't seem like there's a right or wrong answer, but when you put together the globally consolidated book, you get a very different story. Alternatively, I could have been a little sneakier. I could have divided the room in half and asked the left side for A and B, the right side C and D, and I could have paired you in ways that would essentially pump $10,000 out of each of you when I can find a matching pair. That's financial engineering. Financial engineering takes advantage of certain patterns of human behavior. This is irrational. It's irrational because when you're looking at games, you have concave utility. You are risk averse. But it turns out that humans, when you're faced with losses, we end up extraordinarily risk seeking. Our utility function for losses is actually convex. So in fact, the good old hypothesis of a concave utility function is actually false. Experimental evidence has shown that that's violated. Now that's a little subtle. Let me give you something that's even weirder, okay? Which is something called probability matching. This is something that you can actually do with friends uh, if you are so inclined. It's a kind of a cocktail party type of an experiment. We're going to play a game. And the game goes like this. I've got a coin, my coin, and I'm going to flip it many times. And you're going to try to guess whether the coin comes up heads or tails, okay? The coin could be biased, it's my coin, and uh, I get to flip it over and over again. And 
if you are correct in your guess for each toss, I'll pay you a dollar. But if you're wrong, you pay me a dollar. Okay? And we're going to do this many, many times. So the question is, how do you behave? Okay? Now let's suppose, you don't know what the probability of a head is for the coin. It's my coin, not yours. But after we try, I don't know, 20 or 30 trials, very quickly, you observe that heads comes up more frequently than tails. In fact, you observe that heads comes up about 75% of the time and tails comes up about 25% of the time. So, what should you do? What is the optimal behavior in this case? Anybody? Yeah? Always choose heads. Always choose heads. Right. Because if the probability of heads is greater than the probability of tails, and since I'm tossing the coin, unless I'm a very specially adept coin tosser, there's no dependence between <coughs> one toss and another. What you're doing is betting on the higher yielding side, right? That's not what people do. When we run these experiments, and this, is, this was started being done in the 1920s and 30s, that's the profit maximizing strategy. What people do is they randomize, and they seem to randomize with the same probability of the coin. In other words, they choose heads 75% of the time, and they choose tails 25% of the time. <laughs> stupid, right? That's right. The human animal, the stupidest creature on earth. And this example was actually brought home to me in a most uh, remarkable way with a story that I was told by one of my colleagues at MIT, Steve Ross, who claims he heard it from uh, 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 Amos Tversky. Tversky is a psychologist at Stanford. He died many years ago, so I can't verify the story, but, but Ross tells me that this is, uh, this is true. Tversky says that in the 1940s, in the, the U.S. ran bombing missions over Germany during World War II. And, um, before bomber pilots got on the airplane, they had to make a choice. They had to choose whether or not they wanted to wear a parachute or a flak jacket, because you could get killed in one of two ways flying these bomber missions. You could get killed by surface-to-air missiles, and in which case, if your airplane got shot down, you needed a parachute. Or you could get hit by air-to-air -air bullets that when it hit inside the, the uh, cabin of the airplane, it split into these very sharp pieces of metal that would slice your organs unless you had a flak jacket. And in those days, flak jackets and parachutes were made out of very thick canvas, and they were very heavy, so you couldn't pick, take both. You could only pick one or the other. And it turns out that the probability of getting killed by uh, getting shot down with a surface-to-air missile, in which case you need a parachute, the probability of that was 25%. The probability of getting hit with air-to-air -air, uh, uh, bullets was something like 75%. So you had these two different ways of getting killed, what should you do? You should always wear the flak jacket, right? The pilots, who were given a choice, because it was their lives that they were taking into their own hands, they were given a choice. And the strange thing is that these pilots, they randomized. They actually picked flak jackets 75% of the time, and they picked parachutes 25% of the time. Why? The strange thing is that this behavior is found not just in humans, but it's common to ants, fish, pigeon, primates, bees. Virtually every creature that can choose between A or B actually exhibits this kind of weird probability matching behavior. How silly, how irrational, or is it? Well, what Tom and I have been doing in our research is to try to develop uh, some kind of logic for why these behaviors emerge. And so we propose an evolutionary explanation that's almost trivial. It's a really simple model. In fact, you need nothing more than high school math to do this. And what we find is that in this simple evolutionary framework that I'm about to show you, and it's going to take approximately five minutes to derive it, in this simple framework, we can derive this kind of behavior as well as the behavior that we saw before about A versus B and C versus D, as well as lots of other behaviors using the very basic principles of natural selection. And the basic uh, story is that these so-called biases that we uh, find so irrational, they're actually hardwired in all of us. 
not just humans, but in most animal species, for a reason. They're there because they help us adapt to certain environmental conditions. And it's really the environment that actually determines these kinds of behaviors. And the question that I'm going to focus on is what kind of environment do we have? A systematic environment in which we are all subject to the same kinds of risks, or an idiosyncratic environment in which your risks and my risks are different. In those two different environments, the behavior that emerges is actually quite different. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Now, uh, since we uh, are limited amount of time, I don't want to keep you too late. Um, let me just go through and give you a couple of examples, and then I'm going to uh, uh, try to give you the kind of a basic idea. There's a lot of literature that is related to what we're doing, and we have a paper on our website and uh, another one that's uh, coming out soon. So you can take a look at that for the references. The, the reason I, I put the list of names up there is simply to indicate that the one common denominator in all of this, even though it cuts across lots of different areas, is mathematics. The mathematics is really what ties all of the various different perspectives <coughs> together, and so it's a wonderful thing to be able to look at this in a relatively simple framework and say, ah, yeah, the, the anthropologists and the economists and the psychologists, they're actually talking about the same kinds of things. So let me start with the simple model. The model is going to have individuals, not necessarily human, they're just individuals, they're just creatures that are going to be asexual semiparous individuals. Now, what does that mean, asexual semiparous? I'm not referring to MIT undergraduates. So, <laughs> um, what this means is that you have individuals that will reproduce once <coughs> in their lives, and the, the reproduction is just uh, without any kind of, of sex, no mutation or anything like that. Individuals live for one period. They make a decision, A versus B. And that decision leads to a certain number of offspring, XA or XB. And then the individual dies, and their offspring go on and reproduce as well. So the reproduction is simply giving birth to XA or XB. And these are random number of offspring. So XA and XB are random variables. And we're going to assert that the behavior of the parent will be transmitted perfectly to the offspring. In a minute, I'll tell you what I mean by behavior. But whatever that behavior is, there's going to be perfect genetic transmission of that behavior from one generation to the next. Okay? So what's the behavior? Well, the behavior I'm going to parameterize in a very simple way. So this particular individual, which I have as a little blue dot, is going to be picking a choice of A versus B. And if you pick A, you get XA. If you pick B, you get XB. And here's an example where XA happens to be a three offspring. That's the random draw that you get. And XB is eight offspring. That's the random draw you get there. Uh, nine. Sorry. Um, the individual behavior that I'm modeling is a simple one in that I'm going to assert that this individual chooses between A or B with a probability F. So it's a coin toss, a Bernoulli trial. And F, the parameter, the probability that controls the probability of selecting A, is the behavior that I'm referring to. Okay? So f is a number between 0 and 1, including 0 and 1. And given a particular f, this individual will flip his own coin with a probability f of choosing a and a probability 1 minus f of choosing b. And the offspring will also have the same parameter f. That's the sense in which genetic transmission is perfect. Okay? There's no mutation. If there were, then the offspring might have a different f than the parent. I'm assuming that it's actually identical. Okay? So you can think of an entire equivalence class of Fs out there behaving in this manner. Now, I'm going to allow F to be 1 or 0. So this includes deterministic behavior. If you've got an individual that always chooses A, in that case, that individual has an F of 1. If you've got an individual that always chooses B, then that individual has an F equal to 0. If you've got an individual that flips 50-50, then F is equal to 0.5 and so on, okay? So the idea is to try to understand how the population of individuals evolve given a particular set of assumptions on the distribution XA and XB. Now here's where math comes in and biology goes out the window. All of the interesting <coughs> biological aspects of this problem we abstract away by assuming that there's some joint distribution for XA and XB. In other words, 
all the stuff that biologists really care about, like how do mutations happen, uh, what, you know, how do environmental factors lead to greater uh, number of offspring or fewer number of offspring, how does the weather factor into all of that stuff, all of those considerations we are building into this distribution function. Okay? So this is not going to be of very much interest to a biologist because all the stuff that they care about we bury in this distribution, but it's going to be fascinating to economists because out of this we're going to actually see how behavior, this F parameter, how it emerges out of the population. So what we're going to do is we take an F and we allow this F to reproduce and over time you get a bunch of Fs. And the way that we're going to ask the question what types of behavior evolves out of this primordial soup is to start with all possible Fs between 0 and 1, including 0 and 1. So we begin with a population that all of the different behaviors are equally representative in, represented in so that we have a, a fair start, right? Uniform distribution. And then we allow them to reproduce. And over time, we ask the question, what behavior dominates? In other words, what kind of F grows the fastest? Because we know that given this is multiplicative growth, right? We're reproducing and giving offspring, and those offspring are giving offspring, and so on. After a while, we'll see that a certain F dominates. In this case, the green F, F4. In this case, we say that the behavior F4 is what dominates. So what we observe in the population after many, many generations is this kind of behavior. Okay? Well, that's it. That's the model. Now, it seems like it, it, it's impossible to get anything interesting out of it, but in a minute, I'm going to show you we get enormously interesting insights out of this very simple framework. Now, in order to do that, I have to make some assumptions about the distribution of XA and XB. So let me make two very simple assumptions. Let me assume that the distribution of X and XB is identical across individuals in a given generation. So what, what that means is, let me make it clear. If you choose XA and I choose XA in the same generation, we will actually get the same number of offspring XA. That's a random variable, so we don't know what it is in advance, but whatever the realization is, we get the exact same realization. Okay. So we are literally getting the same choice. This is an example of what we call systematic risk. That means that your reproductive risk and my reproductive risk are identical. We are part of the same ecological niche. The alternative would be to say, no, your XA and my XA may come from the same distribution, but they're different draws. They're independent draws. We're going to talk about that next. That's going to be an example of idiosyncratic risk, in which case that means that your ecological niche may look the same as mine, but they actually have independent draws. So they're going to be different. But for now, let's assume that they're the same. But over generation after generation, the distribution is independently and identically distributed. So that means that tomorrow's generation will have a different draw from today's generation. It'll be drawn from the same distribution, but it'll be a different draw. Okay. And finally, I'm going to assume that these individuals these asexual semiparous beings are completely mindless. They have no brains, they have no volition, they're not making any kind of decisions, they're just behaving. They're just choosing A or B with the particular F that they happen to be endowed with. And there are no resource constraints, so my choice of XA or XB has nothing to do with your choice of XA or XB. It doesn't influence you in any way. We're just a bunch of beings that are choosing in our own way and over time, we're going to ask the question, does there exist an F that grows faster than all other Fs? Is there an optimal F? Because if there is, that F pretty soon will take over the population. And then when you look at the population, you're going to say, gee, people are behaving like that F star, that maximal F. That's what evolution is. According to Ernst Mayer, F is, uh, evolution is a process of elimination. It's finding the F star that survives. Woody Allen said that uh, success is 90%. 90% uh, of success is just showing up. Uh, in this case, 100% of success is just showing up. We want to find the F star that always shows up. So let's see, how do we do that? Well, we got to do a little bit of math here. This is really the only part where you need your chocolate. Um, we're going to start with 
the number of individuals of type F in generation T, okay? And that number is simply equal to the number of children that type F parents had in the previous generation. So that's the summation across all type F parents in the previous generation of the number of kids that each of these individuals I had at generation T of type F. And when you plug in for that Bernoulli trial variable, you get very simply the sum of all these Bernoulli indicators multiplied by XA plus the one minus the sum of all these Bernoulli indicators times XB. And these Bernoulli indicators, they're just zero one variables, right? So this is just adding up the number of kids that have chosen, the number of parents that have chosen A in generation T minus one, leading to XA kids. And similarly, this is the number of times that these parents have chosen B. And you know that because of the independence assumption that the law of large numbers applies. So when the number of individuals in that generation gets big, then these number of choices really converges to the population parameter f and 1 minus f. And when you do a little bit of math, not a whole lot, this is basic arithmetic and algebra, you can show that the geometric growth rate of this population converges in probability to this expectation, the expectation of the logarithm of the expected number of offspring given that you're choosing with probability f just the geometric growth rate of the population F people, right? Any questions about that? It's pretty, pretty straightforward, right? So now the question of which behavior survives and emerges is a question of which F maximizes this expectation. Now so far I haven't said anything about the distribution. All I've said is that we have IID over time, which allowed me to use the law of large numbers and identical distribution and identical realizations which allowed me to pull the XA out of this parenthesis. So all I'm assumed is a really very, very, very basic and fairly general kind of a framework. Nothing about the distribution itself other than the moments exist. Okay, well how do we maximize this? I think you all should know how to maximize this. Uh, take a derivative and then take another one. If you take the second derivative, you can show that the second derivative is always negative on the unit interval, which means the function is globally concave in F. That's nice, because that means that a unique maximum exists. And there are only three ways that it can be concave. It can be concave like this, in which case the maximum is at the left end point at zero, or it could be concave like that, in which case the maximum is at the right end point, or it could be concave like this, in which case the maximum is at the interior. Right? <coughs> so the answer as to what function, what F star maximizes this geometric growth rate turns out to be this. It's a three-part solution. And here it is. F star equals one. You should always choose A if the following two inequalities hold. If the expected value of the ratio of x A to x B is greater than one, and the expected value of the reciprocal is less than one, that's telling you that A is really much better than B. So you better just pick A all the time, because you'll grow faster that way. On the other hand, if it turns out that the reverse <coughs> inequalities are true, if the expected value of x A over x B is less than one, and the expected value of this reciprocal is greater than one, that's telling you that B is much better than A. So you better pick B all the time, F star equals zero. But here's the weird one. The one in the middle is the one where that concave function has a, a maximum at the interior. And it turns out that this is a situation where the expected value of XA over XB is greater than or equal to one, but the expected value of the reciprocal is also greater than or equal to one. <coughs> That's weird, but it can happen. It can happen actually pretty naturally. And when it does happen, what it says is that your F star will be strictly between zero and one. It means that you will actually act randomly. You will not act consistently, always picking A or always picking B. You will actually randomize with probability F star. 
And the solution of F star is given implicitly by this equation, which says that you basically want to choose so that your expected yield as a fraction of your average value is equalized between the two choices in order to grow the fastest. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute an example of this. But before I do, let me just explain what we mean by F star being the fastest growing population. If you pick any other F besides F star, if that's your behavior, then you can show that the ratio of your population to the F star population, that ratio converges to zero exponentially fast. F star is reproducing like rabbits, and F prime is not producing nearly as fast. So, you know, think of Mormons versus the Shakers. Right? If you reproduce faster, you will pretty soon take over the population very, very quickly. Now, remember that F star is the thing that maximizes <coughs> population growth. It's not necessarily the thing that maximizes your individual expected number of offspring. That's a different question. So let me show you an example of how this works. Um, here's an example where I'm going to assume a very specific distribution for phi of xA and xB. I'm going to assume that xA and xB are themselves Bernoulli random variables and that there are two possible states of the world, one and two. The state of the world, one, if you pick A, you'll get M offspring, and if you pick B, you'll get zero offspring. Whereas in state two, it's exactly the reverse. You'll get zero offspring if you pick A, and you'll get M offspring if you pick B, and the probability of being in state one is P, the probability of being in state two is one minus P. So that's an example of this joint distribution. If you plug in for that joint distribution and compute the expected values on the previous slide and you do the math, you get an interesting solution for F star. F star equals P. Probability matching. Now, if you're like me, you look at this, this makes no sense. I, I don't really have an intuition for this. So let me give you a biological example of this, and you'll see in two minutes exactly what's going on with this behavior. The biological example has to do with a particular environment where 75% of the time it's sunny and 25% of the time it's raining. And you, as the asexual semi-parous creature in this environment, you have to make a choice between building your nest in the valley or on a plateau. That's A versus B, okay? Now, if you build your nest in the valley, and it turns out to be sunny, that's good news. Why? Because in the valley, there's water, and there's shade pr protecting you from the sun. So your offspring will thrive and survive. You'll have xA equal to 3. But if you have your offspring in the valley, and it rains, that's bad news, because the valley will flood, drowning your offspring. In that case, xA is equal to 0. On the other hand, if you pick B, then it's exactly the opposite. If it's sunny, and you pick B, you're up on the plateau, that's bad news, because there's no water, and the sun's rays will burn your offspring to death. <laughs> XA equals zero. But if you're on the plateau, and it's raining, well, there's no sun to burn your offspring, but there's water, and you won't drown because it's on a plateau, you'll survive. So what should you do? How should you decide between choosing A or B? Suppose you're all rational economists maximizing expected utility. Which would you pick, A or B? This is probability matching. The example that I gave you of the coin toss. What would you pick? What's the rational thing to do? A. Always pick A, because this is the higher probability of surviving. If you always pick A, you're going to have 75% of the time three offspring, 25% of the time no offspring, right? That's the rational thing to do. Well, let's compare that rational thing versus F star. And for those biologists in the audience who don't like math, I'm going to simulate this. So I'm going to simulate F star uh, here, and then F equal to 1. This is the economist always picking the rational thing, 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. Let's give it a try and see what happens. Notice that F equal 1 is growing faster because it is the optimal thing. It's growing faster, faster, and up. Oh, what happened? What happened is that the first time it rains, all the economists get wiped out. <laughs> and then there are no more economists, which some people would say is a good thing. If there's perfect genetic transmission, which I've assumed, I'm going I'm to come back to that later on, 
and relax that assumption. But for now, you can see very starkly what's happening. This behavior is optimal for the individual, but it can't persist if we all do it. If we all do it, the first time that we have a bad draw for the entire environment, we're gone. We're the shakers. Great furniture, they're not around to sell it anymore. <laughs> and it turns out that the population that grows fastest is this one that matches the probability. Now, it turns out that the mathematics work just right in that case. We've solved the more general case where you don't have exactly this kind of opposing types of behavior. And in that case, you get randomization without exact probability matching. You get a whole array of complex behavior. Probability matching, randomization, risk aversion, all of these things emerge organically out of this really dumb model. Really simple. If it's so simple and we have these behaviors, what does that tell you about the likelihood that we see this among different creatures? If, if it's so simple, we expect that it will probably be fairly ancient in terms of the hard wiring that we are all imbued with because we've all faced this process of selection. Now, uh, since I'm running out of time, I want to just tell you one more thing, which is that if I change one small assumption, all of this goes away. If I change the assumption that XA and XB are identical for all of us and go to the idiosyncratic case that I warned you about, if I assume that your offspring and my offspring are identically distributed, but independently distributed as well, so that we are not part of the same ecological niche, you have your own microclimate, I have my own microclimate. So when I choose A, I get one draw of XA. When you choose A, you get a different draw of XA from the same distribution, but a different draw. If I make that one small change, the math actually changes as well. I can't pull this out now. This has to stay inside. I have to apply the law of large numbers to the product. And because they're independent, the product of the, the expectation of the product, the product of the expectation. And when you get right down to it, the geometric growth rate turns out to look like this. F times not XA, but mu of XA, the expectation. In other words, this is not random anymore. And when you maximize that function, which is a non-random function, it turns out that there's only two possibilities, either one or zero. In this case, the economist rules. In this case, you should always do the smart, selfish, optimal thing. Pick the choice that has the higher expected value. Why? Because that behavior, selfish behavior, can survive. And the reason it can survive is because we're in different climates. So the chances of all of us getting wiped out by the rain is zero. Because it will have to rain over each of our individual heads. And that's a vanishingly small event with a large enough population. The way to think about this is that nature abhors an undiversified debt. If the environment is systematic, we have to act idiosyncratically. We have to diversify by acting weirdly, by choosing randomly. If, on the other hand, nature is already diversified, we can afford to be selfish and do the optimal thing. Now, when I say we can afford, I'm actually making believe that there's somebody out there making decisions. Remember, this is totally mindless. We're just behaving. And the point is that as we behave, these kinds of behaviors emerge naturally depending on the environment. So bounded rationality intelligence comes out of the environment. Herbert Simon had a conjecture about this years ago. He won a Nobel Prize in economics for it. But he was roundly dismissed by economists because he didn't have the, the mathematics of evolution backing up his theories. If you take these simple models that we developed and apply them to what Simon was thinking about, basically he's concluded that, we, we concluded that his conclusions actually can be derived formally based upon environmental constraints. In other words, we are smart or dumb as a function of how the environment uh, behaves. And there are a number of extensions. Since I'm running out of time, I won't talk about it, uh, all of them. But I'll just give you one last example. I'll leave you with this. We can apply this simple evolutionary uh, process to how we choose uh, individual decisions, even within a single uh, lifetime. 
In other words, if we have multiple choices over time, we can apply this kind of a mechanism to selecting good or bad rules of thumb, heuristics, as opposed to optimal strategies. So the fact is that most people aren't as clever and as optimally sophisticated as some of the game theorists would have us believe. But over time, their strategies, through pure trial, uh, uh, trial and error, become extraordinarily well-tuned to their environment. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example about a particular algorithm that I've developed for a problem that I face every day. Getting dressed in the morning. I think you face that problem too. How do we decide how to get dressed in the morning? Well, in order for me to describe to you the challenge of this particular problem, I need to tell you what my wardrobe looks like. So let me tell you what my wardrobe looks like. I've got five jackets, 10 pairs of pants, 20 ties, 10 shirts, 10 pairs of socks, four pairs of shoes, and five belts. That's it. That's my whole wardrobe. Now, you might think that's a rather limited wardrobe, but I'll have you know that if you do the combinatorics, that gives me two million unique outfits. <laughs> now, it's true. You're, you're, you're laughing because probably you realize, as my wife often tells me, that not all outfits are equally compelling from a fashion perspective. So I've got an optimization problem. I need to pick the outfit that's just right for the occasion. Suppose it takes me one second to evaluate the fashion content of each outfit. <laughs> How long would it take for me to get dressed? Well, if you do the math, <laughs> it would take me 23.1 days to get dressed. I promise you, I don't take that long to get dressed. <laughs> How is that possible? It's amazing. Do I have some kind of supercomputer up here that is able to optimize much more quickly than one second per outfit? The answer is no. It's that I actually don't optimize. Herbert Simon would say that we satisfy. We come up with solutions that are satisfactory, <laughs> not optimal. But how do I know what's satisfactory? Well, it turns out that the theory of evolution will tell us what is satisfactory. And I'll give you an example of how I develop my algorithm. When I was six years old, growing up in New York City, at that time some marketing genius came up with the idea that we took a Superman emblem and put it on a jacket and sell a lot of these to kids. And so I desperately wanted one of these Superman jackets. And because I grew up in a single parent household, we didn't have a lot of money, it was a very big purchase and you know, we couldn't afford it. But like any good six year old, I did what we all do, which is we nag. I nagged my mother for weeks on end to get me this jacket. I was so keen to have it that after several weeks of nagging, she finally relented. She said, fine, I'll get you the jacket. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. Friday evening, after work, she took me to Alexander's on Queens Boulevard, went there, got the jacket, spent the whole weekend wearing the jacket. I slept in the jacket, I ate the jacket. I would have taken a bath in the jacket if she didn't force me to take it off. Come Monday morning, I got up extra early, and I was already in my jacket, got in front of the mirror, did all my action poses, saw how I looked, and you know, I thought, oh, man, the kids are going to be really, really impressed. And I spent so much time in front of the mirror, I was late for school. And in those days, if you were late for school, you had to get a note from your parent, otherwise they wouldn't let you in the building. So I had to get a note from my mother, six years old, I had to walk and find her office, get, get a note from her, walked into the classroom at 9.30, and um, you know, the teacher was already at her desk, all the students were sitting down, I gave her the note, walked to the back of the room, and I was totally and utterly mortified because everybody was staring at me. I was really embarrassed. And you know I must have been mortified because over 40 years later, I still remember that day. <laughs> and I still remember how horrible I felt. And guess what? After that day, it never ever took me more than five minutes to get dressed in the morning. I changed my algorithm because I found uh, that that didn't work. Now, I dare say that Tom Cruise has a different algorithm for getting dressed in the morning. He probably spends a lot more than five minutes, probably spends more than five minutes quaffing his hair um, than me. <laughs> but <laughs> it's because he experienced a different evolutionary path for the algorithms. And so the idea behind the behavioral bias is the reason that we're so stupid is not that we are actually stupid, it's that we have heuristics that are not well adapted to the current context that they're in. So when you engage in a behavioral bias, it's not that the bias is stupid. In many cases, the algorithm is quite effective. But you take it out of context, it looks stupid. The undulations of a great white shark underwater are beautiful and extraordinarily efficient. It's one of the most efficient killing machines on the planet. And it's been around for hundreds of millions of years, unlike us, who've been around for about 100,000 years. 
you take a great white shark and you dump them on the beach, and those undulations look really irrational. They look really stupid. Nobody's scared of a shark on the beach. So next time you see something stupid, ask yourself, why is it stupid? What context was this behavior meant for? And what is the context now? Only then can we really understand behavior. And ultimately, the origin of this behavior, and the way to understand it, is through mathematics. And that's one of the reasons I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you very much, and we have to answer questions. share kind of aspect of the, the kin selective argument? Yes, absolutely. So this is a much simpler version. Kin selection is actually a more involved, more sophisticated theory that basically makes an argument that the closer you are genetically to a particular uh, uh, individual, the more likely you are to engage in altruistic behavior. Here, there actually is no dynamics across individuals. So if you were to add those dynamics, you would actually get kin selection out of this. The reason we didn't do that is we wanted to ask the question, what if you eliminated all strategic considerations, all resource constraints, what if you tried to make this as absolutely bare bones simple as possible, would you actually get anything interesting? And the fact is that there are certain behaviors like risk aversion, loss aversion, probability matching that emerge even out of that basic setting. Kin selection is a bit more sophisticated so that if you add resource constraints, you'll get that. And if you make other uh, changes, like uh, allowing for sexual reproduction, uh, multiple generations, where you can choose within a generation multiple times, you'll get much, much more sophisticated behavior. Yes? Well, if, Rick, if Rick Santorum is right about evolution, then how does what you're saying make any sense at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this theory actually predicts that there will be people like Rick Santorum. <laughs> And uh, what can I tell you? I'm not going to try to defend Mother Nature. Yes. <laughs> on your slide, you're also on blends. And so when you're maximizing, you don't write max, you write arg max. Sorry? When you were maximizing over F, yeah. you wrote arg max over F. Which I've yes. never seen that before. Why oh, I'm sorry. So arg max simply means it's the argument of the maximum. And because F is equal to the, uh, uh, let me go back and show explain what I mean by that. Um, uh, wait, wait, after wait, this, wait. yeah. Um, oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's before. I know what you mean. Um, it is, one more, yeah, here. Yeah. So this R oh, max, oh, oh. it is the argument of this okay. maximum. Okay, it is where to add. Oh. Yeah, that's why. I know that people are going to nail me, so I have to check these slides very carefully. So, thank you for, uh, for, for trying. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So, you've shown in this thing that like, in cases of systematic risk, yeah. you get these situations. Yeah. But, I mean, just thinking about the environment, do yeah. you think if idiosyncratic risk is more the scenario we face? Because we aren't typically faced with a scenario where the number of offspring I'm going to have is exactly the same as the number yeah, of offspring. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to have. That's right. Yes, that's a great question. So th let me repeat it for everybody here. So the question is: Isn't idiosyncratic risk more common than systematic risk? 
And if so, what, what do we conclude from that? Well, so the, the answer, the simple answer is actually, we're faced with both kinds of risks all the time. So it's a continuum. It's not either or. I did it this way just because it's easy for the, the math to sort of work itself out when you divide it up. But in fact, in our paper, we have the more realistic case where you have both idiosyncratic and systematic risk together. And then the question is, how much of one or the other do you have? That gives rise to really complex behavior. So let me give you a concrete example of why that, that distinction matters and how it can matter in our daily lives. A few people are walking down the street uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan. They're American soldiers. And in the midst of their uh, stroll, uh, a grenade is tossed in front of them. One of the soldiers jumps on the grenade using his body as a shield to protect his fellow soldiers, giving himself up. Isn't that stupid? That soldier has a family a wife, two small kids. Why would anybody do something as stupid as to give up your life? Well, it's because soldiers are trained to do that. They're trained to do that because in that environment, that's the only way you're going to survive. In other words, altruistic behavior, extreme altruism, giving up your life for somebody else, that is actually optimal behavior when there's systematic risk that you're, you're faced with extreme risk that everybody faces. Take that same set of individuals, put them in New York in Times Square. You're walking down the street in Times Square and you see a grenade. Are you going to jump on that grenade? I, I think you might kick it to you know, the next person. <laughs> you know. No, because that's a situation where the threat is not systematic, it's idiosyncratic. Some idiot tossed a grenade in Times Square. You know, it's not, it's not they're out to get you and your compatriots, and all they care about is, are you an American soldier? If you are, you're dead. That's an example where groupings, a lot like the kind of gangs you're talking about, once you've identified yourself as red or blue, that's all that matters in terms of the risk involved in that type of threat. But there are lots of other threats. You can cut your foot and get tetanus, you can actually get a cold, you can get appendicitis. So the different levels of threats, some of them are systematic, some of them are idiosyncratic, they're happening all the time. So that's one of the reasons why human behavior looks as complex as it is. It's not necessarily that we're so brilliant. We, we are for other reasons, but a lot of the behaviors that we engage in are complex because our environment is complex. This is what Herbert Simon came up with. He pointed out that when you see an ant crossing a beach, the path that the ant takes looks really complex. Is it because the ant is really smart and has GPS? No, it's because the ant has simple rules, and the environment is very complex. So the ant is following the environment in response. And ultimately, I think that's really what we see. Yeah, I'm curious if you look at something like a poker player. Do the really good ones avoid this probability matching? I mean, how good is a poker player do you have to be before you know not to avoid these? Uh, actually, not that, not that good a poker player, because you learn pretty quickly that this is a stupid kind of behavior for that particular context. So in fact, we've done experiments, and psychologists have done experiments with poker players, where a lot of the things that are problems for individuals, like the loss aversion, they don't behave that way either. And so it's really the environment that you're in and how often you're doing it to see yeah, whether or not you adapt. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, um, the formula that you had on there was, it was exactly the Kelly gambling criteria. Yes. Where if you're trying to multiply your dollars instead of creatures. Yeah, that's right. In, in fact, you're absolutely right. This is the Kelly criterion right here, maximizing logarithmic the geometric growth rate. That's right. Um, and there's been a big debate in economics about whether or not people have logarithmic utility. The fact is that this, though, is not about your utility. This is about the growth, rate, growth rates of offspring. So it's slightly different. In the Kelly criteria for gambling, it does make sense because money begets more money and you get to grow. That's right. So if you're a gambler, you ought to do this and this ought to be your money. And a lot of gamblers ultimately figure that out after many, many trials and many, many you know, lost, uh, lost games. Yeah. Would you say that human behavior is determined more by experience or emotions? Because like, if you say that it's determined more by heuristics and we do not comply with the expected utility theory, yes. then we go into prospect theory, yes. which weighs the expected values with the emotions. But then um, it is also shown that uh, with a competition, that if you 
uh, make people experience the situation over and over again, prospect theory model doesn't actually hold. Right. So if I had more time, I would actually show you that this explains not only prospect theory, but it also explains why prospect theory fails. So in other words, this model, you can see it in our paper, we actually explain how it is that you get this S-shaped utility function, but also why it is that when experimenters are playing around with it, they change the scale and that changes the results. It's because what people care about is the total reproductive success of their wealth. What they don't care as much about is incremental wealth. So when I give you either plus $240,000 or nothing, you need to translate that into what does it mean for your reproductive success. What it means for your reproductive success may be different from what it means for my reproductive success because you and I have different net worths. And the, the experiments don't control for that. If they did, they would find much more consistency and prospect theory comes right out of this. But you actually bring up a good point uh, having to do with emotion. Emotion versus logical deliberation and mathematical computation may seem at odds with each other. But in fact, those are just two different biological devices for a particular purpose, namely survival. What we argue is that this simple model suggests that there are certain components of the brain that are primitive, and the wiring is primitive because they actually exist in all species. And because of the simplicity of this evolutionary model, you would expect that this must be one of the first behaviors that could have emerged out of primordial soup. In fact, We've seen this kind of behavior, probability matching behavior, actually exist in bacteria that uh, exhibit certain kind of chemotaxis. They go to uh, certain regions of higher concentration fluids. So that part of the brain will have certain behaviors that are hardwired, but then from an evolutionary time scale perspective, there are other parts of the brain that are newer. For example, the neocortex, the newer part of the cortex, has come later which suggests that there's actually a hierarchy of behavior. Certain behaviors are more primitive, other behaviors are newer and therefore more high level. Uh, a good example of this is, uh, you know, uh, it turns out that your midbrain, your fight and flight response, is a very primitive component of the brain. The ability to solve differential equations, it's a newer part of the brain. <laughs> if you're being charged by a saber-toothed tiger, which is gonna be more important? For you to be scared and run like hell, or for you to be able to solve differential equations? <laughs> Well, even if you're from MIT, it, it'll be better for you to run uh, and, and uh, have that fight or flight response kick in. Neuroscientists have documented that, in fact, when you are subject to a lot of strong emotional stimulus, that actually cuts off the flow of blood to your prefrontal cortex. It is actually harder for you to do math problems when you're emotionally uh, stimulated. So uh, that's an example of how neuroscience can actually tell us and confirm some of these behavioral calculations that we're doing. In fact, that was the last slide that I didn't have a chance to talk to, which is that what we were doing now is applying these ideas to the behavior of neurons. And within the behavior of neurons, you have some really interesting complexity that emerges because this binary choice model that I've described, think about that as neurons switching on or off. If you sequence a whole bunch of these neurons in parallel, what you get is a binary bit string that can represent very complex behavior and then you have evolution at the speed of thought. That's one of the reasons that Homo sapiens have dominated other species. It's because we don't have to wait for our offspring to adapt to the environment. We can think and come up with lots of counterfactual scenarios and decide which is going to be the best fit for a given environment. So there's some really beautiful mathematics that actually coincides with the neuroscience and so some collaborators of mine and, and I are, are actually working on that. And I would encourage all of you to start thinking about this because we need, we need the help. We need more smart people working on these problems. I'm really way over, so let me let you go and have dinner. Thank you very much.